All right, here we go. The mighty return of Donnell Rawlings. Fresh off his brand new Netflix special, A New Day, on the day that it's actually dropping today. Donnell, was good? I'm chilling, son. <laughs> All right, uh, any particular reason uh, you're turning around right now? I don't trust the white man. I can't look him into his face until I get deeper into this conversation. And I'm embodying the energy of Miles Davis. I'm on my Miles Davis shit. Okay, because Miles used to turn around when he used to perform. I know. Now, see, that's another example of white man trying to make the black man do what he wants him to do. We're not going to do that today. Okay. All right. Well, let's get started then. New Netflix special. Yes. A new day. A new day. Birds flying high. You know how I feel. Yep. Breeze drifting on by. You know how I feel. Mm -hmm. It's a new day. It's a new dawn. It's a new life for me and Vlad. I'm feeling good. Bum, bum. Bum, 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 bum. I got to watch it early. And what are your, okay, well, what are your thoughts? Thought it was great, man. You killed it. That's what I'm talking you about, sir. It. All right, now that we understand each other. <laughs> <laughs> now that we understand, good to see you. Thank you. So if, I was, first, first, first if I would have said it was garbage, you would have just stayed like that the whole time, right? No, I would have called you a hater. I would have called you the devil. I would have called you a police. I would have called you 007. But I got to ask you a question. Is it fair... Mm -hmm. to start a Vlad interview off happy. Yeah. Because every time I see it, it's... Yeah. I don't know what the happiness is. <laughs> and I know there's some happiness around here, and I know that, uh, that, uh... How do you say this? Comedy hasn't been in a happy place for a very long time. Mm, not recently. Unfortunately. Unfortunately. Very unfortunate. Mm -hmm. Well, let's talk about some happy stuff, though. Uh, well, I mean, it's not going to be happy for everyone involved. Because, like I said, I watched Netflix special early. Shout out to the people at Netflix. They gave me the little early code to right. go in and access it before the rest of the world did. Right. So let's talk about the different topics that were covered in this right. interview. And we're going to start off with the Alabama brawl. Right. You said it's the greatest fight in the history of... Of, of all fights. fights. I'll of put that all against, fights. I'll, I'll put it against the Thriller in, the, in Manila. Okay. i put that against the top uh, 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 videos on World Star. Okay. And the reason why I say that, because it kind of uh, reinvigorated uh, a civil rights movement. Mm. And I said, and I've said this before, that uh, black folks, we've been wanting to be positive, to do something negative hmm. for a very long time but we didn't have a sense of unity. We didn't have something to bring us together. We didn't have something for us to come together and do something that would, some people that would understand this, uh, uplift us and make us feel like we are, we are one. Mm. And that brawl made us feel like we was one. It was a hell of a brawl. It was a hell of a brawl. It started off one way and it ended another way. Oh, well, as soon as it that was hat, a best, as soon as that hat flew up in the air, you knew. That hat. That the tide was turning. But nobody <laughs> knew what that symbol, nobody right. knew what that thing was going to be. And it was interesting because when as me, when, when you first watch it, when you first started watching that video, you asking yourself, where is his help? Where are the people? Because they was getting it out, mm -hmm. right? But we didn't know that it was, it was pockets of black people here, pockets of black people here, pockets of black people here. And when that hat came out, it's the phrase they say, fuck around and find out. And those Budweiser drinking, uh, MAGA Force One wearers found, fucked around and found out. Uh, yeah, it was a hell of a fight. And, you know, they started making songs about the fight. I never heard the song. There were songs. And, and I remember there was a standout line in one of the songs. It says, shout out to the first black man who swam to a fight. And that's another thing, and that's what that was very impressive for me right there because he didn't really <laughs> swim; he was standing up and swimming at the same time. <laughs> what? You, you, no, if you if you if you notice it, he was like walk swimming, and you didn't see no feet in the background. Oh, all you saw was him like wow, wow. So he just walk. He was yeah. like walking fast in the water, yeah. basically he using his arms to speed it along. He had to get. It. And I'm not a person that like think that violence is the answer, but in this, in this case, especially when you got a guy just trying to do his job, dealing with like some drunk white folks or whatever for for uh people like this well that was violent but i think it, everybody that took a hit they were deserving of it they sh they should have got that should have got that ass whooping and i'm glad that we came together and we did that and then came the folding chair 
the folding chair. Yes. And you, I never say, uh, th- th- this folding chair, I think that probably had more views than any podcast I've seen in years. <laughs> so much that it spawned an uh, opportunity for people to sell merchandise. Mm-hmm. I saw people with folding chair earrings, <laughs> folding chair fronts, folding chair everything. Man. I see that, a folding chair necklace. It, iced out. Yeah, iced iced out. out. Yeah. Because we don't ever want to forget. Right. Think about it. We want to forget slavery. We don't want to forget uh, what they, what white folks did to us, bring us here from Africa. And in history, we don't want to get, we don't want to forget the folding chair. Right. Hey man, listen. Does this chair fold? No, this doesn't. No, fold. it doesn't fold. All right, I'm just making sure. <laughs> I'm safe. I'm just making sure. I'm safe. If you good or not, man? All right. Yeah, one of the cool white folks. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> but you know something? I'm going to say in all seriousness, I think the greatest part about that whole brawl is because keep in mind this is the deep south. Yeah. Where you could get a you know a carry permit faster than you could get a, a COVID card. Right. You know what I'm saying? And nobody got shot. Nobody pulled out a gun. Right. Everyone took their lumps. By this point, their bruises are all healed up. Right. You might have done a few, a couple of days or a week in you know, jail. No one got convicted of anything. Right. And they learned, you know, they lived to fight another day. Yeah, but they, uh, nobody got lumped up, but their egos were bruised. Yeah. You know. But now bruised to the point of pulling out a pistol. And I, you're right. You know, I never even, I didn't never. Think never about where about they that. are. This is, not, this is not Manhattan, you know, where a pistol will get you 30 years. No, this is the middle of the South. Birmingham, Alabama. But the difference is uh, because it was a lot of civilians. But now, if you were to add the police to the equation, there would have probably been some guns pulled out. Maybe. I think it's safe to say that. I don't know. I'm pretty sure it's safe to say that. They would have figured out a way that that black guy did something. And bop, 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 bop. Well, but it was a that, lesson learned. It luckily, was lesson that learned. never happened. Yep. Luckily, that never happened. All right, so let's talk about what else you talked about in the uh, in the stand up. Toxic relationships, right? You say you're in therapy right now. I'm in therapy. Yeah, I'm in therapy, but my therapy is on stage. Okay. Yeah, my therapy is on stage, but uh, and I'm not really a big therapy guy. Oh yeah, I've done therapy. I'm actually in therapy right now. White people. Well, I will say we're breaking the stamina, uh, the, the stigma, stigma of uh, uh, mental health issues, and that's partially because of Charlemagne on the Breakfast Club. Mm. Yeah, he's a big mental health guy. And and and, and it's true that uh, black folks, we don't really look at that as an issue. We don't really deal with the problems we go through and we find escapes in different different ways. You know, you say you're going through something like, nah, I'm good, I just need to smoke a joint. Yeah. Nah, I'm good, I just need to get a drink. Nah, man, shake that shit up, go get your dick sucked, you be all right. So we don't deal with, not in, uh, as of late, we starting to. I mean, as of now, we starting to. But uh, back in the day, we didn't deal with it. We always thought that we could shake it off. And if you got problems, if you can't handle them, you a bitch. Don't cry and all that. But I will say, uh, Charlamagne, for what I know, is on the forefront of uh, erasing that stigma and people getting help. Because we, we do need it. Well, I mean, from my point of view, it kind of comes down to this. Everyone goes through something. Yeah. And everyone ultimately needs someone to talk to. And you end up probably talking to your friends, or who most times are not the best people to talk to. Right. You know, your friend who's never in a relationship <laughs> is the worst at giving relationship advice. It's always like, fuck that bitch, it ain't gonna work out. Right. Right. And then your friend- And got, I do subscribe to that sometimes. Right. And, and then your friend got something on you. So then, you're telling your friend how bad the relationship is, then you get back with her, then you have to kind of avoid your friend because you already told her how, how bad it is. And I'm just saying, when you have a professional who not only is there to listen, he's not going to tell everyone, he's not going to use it against you, and he actually has a certain level of expertise. Yeah, but extreme people that's dealing with extreme toxic relationships, then they go back and forth. At some point, they decide that I can't even tell this motherfucker that no more because I know we probably get back together. And at some point you get to mm-hmm. a, a point in a relationship where you're like this, nobody wants to hear this. So fuck it, I'll just keep it to myself. And that's probably more destructive than anything. Right. And uh, you brought up the whole narcissist term in right. stand-up. Well, Overrated. I've, I've been called narcissist. Yeah, everybody. Now, everybody I, has. I think like every man gets called narcissist at some point. But I think the people that use that term the most are usually the narcissists. The narcissist is calling you a narcissist. 100%. Mm. Reverse psychology. Okay, I see what you're Reverse psychology. Because I've been in situations because I really 
to don't know all these mental health words, right? And once I started learning and understanding what the true definition of those words were, I was like, wait a minute, it's not me, it's possibly you. Uh -huh. You also talked about how toxic girls have the best sex. Man, I it might be tough for some people to understand, but some people do understand. Crazy bitches, pussy be fire. Yeah, this is very true. Yeah. And that is what makes it toxic. Yes. You know you're not supposed to be in this situation, but at the same time, it keeps drawing you back. It's not till you get to a certain level like, well, what are the consequences? Of I know this is fire, but the consequences of that, but some people like to dance and some people will do it mm -hmm. until you get to a point where like, that wasn't worth it. But crazy pussy is fire. I yeah. mean, Fire. And, and to understand, and people assume if you with somebody toxic and you keep putting yourself mentally through the same thing, the first thing they say was, God damn, that pussy must be fire. <laughs> <laughs> now, I'm telling you, like, your response you, is, yes, it was. <laughs> yes, it was. I mean, you say to yourself, there is no rhyme to reason why anybody would put this, put themselves through this, but it must be fire. Shout out to all the toxic chicks out there. What's the most toxic situation you went through with? A girl like this most toxic situation i've had the situation where you say i can't believe i am here right now i can't believe i'm here because of pussy right now that probably had to be in my 20s mm -hmm. that's what happens you know right. when i just thought that it was what they call it. they call it the grip that, that the feeling that holds you on, you know? And I knew that it was probably not gonna be a relationship forever, but I was just living in the moment. Mm -hmm. That's when, when you're in your 20s, that's when you don't give a fuck about anything. You're looking for the person with the bomb shit. When you're in your 20s, you're not really looking for nobody to build with. You're not even really looking for nobody to be madly in love with. When you're in your 20s, you just want to, smash and dash. Mm -hmm. And usually those people are the toxic ones. Those women are the toxic ones. So what actually happened? Did you have something just insane happen to me? Like for example, I remember almost getting jumped by a bunch of like Hell's Angels <laughs> over a girl that I was trying to hold on to that I was not supposed to hold on to. I don't know if I've been in so many toxic relationships I can't pinpoint one. Right, I've had, you know, like 83 voicemails. <laughs> And the the the, the uh, emotion goes from angry to apologetic to happy to angry again, just crying was, to happy. I like, think it was for me when I was very, very young and I lost my virginity. I think that I don't know if that was a toxic relationship, but I realized it wasn't a relationship I was supposed to be in. Because that's that that, my, that first smash, I thought I was in love. Mm. You could not tell me I wasn't in love. I was writing notes. I was writing poems. <laughs> I was writing notes together forever. Success mm. for real. I love you, balloons and everything. But what I realized, one thing about toxic sex, it's not gonna just be for you. You can't have no toxic shit and not share it. And come to find out, what does that song say? Come to find out she was fucking everybody. And my friend, this is when you could tell your friends is trying to save you from a toxic situation or something you shouldn't do, you, you say something like, so what do you say about sauce? What do you think about sauce? So when they do like this, and turn their head, <laughs> when they turn their head, and do like this, and they're like, oh no. And they go side to side, no eye contact, they saying, everybody hit this, son. When they do that, I don't know, rub your face, or if you wipe it off like this, there's a chance that that person is not gonna be in your future. Okay, She's in everybody's future. Well, in the stand up, you talk about how you were into white girls for three years. Yeah, I was, uh, I was uh, um, a dabbler. <laughs> I enjoyed multiple flavors. Okay. I, uh, I think my nickname was Baskin Rawlings. Mm. 31 flavors. 31 flavors, right. Yep, I went through that. I, I went through that period of my life. Right, but that all ended when you started following Dr. Umar Johnson. Uh, Nah, it didn't end. <laughs> you just felt guilty about it? <laughs> nah, it ain't. I'm, I'm, still, I'm, I'm still in Basket Robbins. Right. But not that, but it's like, 
you know, uh, Dr. Umar Johnson has his thought on what relationships supposed to be. Right. Dr. Umar Johnson have his thoughts on what love's supposed to be. You know what I'm saying? And it's a lot of people that subscribe to that, but I think that that opinion, that attitude is, uh, is dated. Well, I've interviewed Umar before. Yeah. And uh, me and him had a little bit of a back and forth. Mm -hmm. uh, he had called me out. He said, oh, DJ Vlad's not building any schools. And I had to point out that Dr. Umar hasn't built a school either. <laughs> Although he's been taking, taking money from people for 834 years. And has a cash app on his social media right now asking for more money. I'm just this, saying. Is, this is what I think. Like Everybody loves pussy. It's a known fact. Everybody has different ways to get their pussy. Right. I remember back in the late, late 90s when the whole uh, poetry scene was really, really popping. All you had to do was go into one of those coffee bars, mm -hmm. coffee shops. Oh, yeah. Snap your fingers and just say, and just drag out your words, I feel that, that, that. And you, all you had to do was say, I'm feeling your energy and your frequency. And women were going crazy. Mm. I think that Dr. Umar loved women. I mean, if you look at any of the pictures he takes, he has a different smile when, he, when he's hugging his sisters. Mm. It's a really happy, cheesy, cheesy grin like, ha, ha. <laughs> and I think that that's the way, I mean, he has a preference. He has a preference. Everybody have a preference. Right, but I know that the things that he speak for the women that really, really feel that and believe it, it makes him a, a superstar and a superman mm. in that area. You call him the blackest man in America. I call him the blackest. You can't outblack him. You can't outblack you, him. I, in, in fact, this is, this is true. I don't know anyone who could outblack. You can't outblack him, him from his clothes, through his through through his clothes, the things that he talk about. You cannot. Nobody can outblack. Dr. Umar. Right, but... Um... And I'll tell you this, and I said it in the special, I agree with a lot of things that Dr. Umar said, but I think it's a fine line when you start trying to tell people who they can love, why they should love them. And I said this in the special, I didn't really go deep into it. If you're saying that this person only posts to love this person, then is that reserved just for like interracial relationships? Or is that has something to do with homosexual relationships? Like, when does this stop? Well, he he's anti uh, homosexuality in general. I, let me tell you something. Man. I, I've interviewed him about this. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he's 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 open about it. Yeah, but it's like I mean, you open about it, or whatever. But like, people and the way people and their thoughts have have evolved. Right. You have a gay brother. You know, I have talked, a gay brother. He talked about that in the special as well. Yeah. But, um, uh, like, but it, like yeah. people people have evolved and their thoughts have evolved. Yes. I would. I'm not. I'm not trying to have like a, a like a debate with a Dr. Umar because he would probably eat like like probably eat me alive. But at the same time, I'm like this, and I said in my special, I'm too old to let somebody curve or tell me who I should like, love, or fuck. Right. He refers to it as bunny hopping. Bunny hopping. It's bunny hopping. They got different <laughs> terms. If you're white, if you're a black chick, and you date white women, you swimming in the milk. Mm. If you're a black dude dating white chicks, you bunny hopping. Mm. You know, but that's, oh, swimming in the milk. Okay. Yeah, you, like you swimming second. in swimming in the milk, <laughs> right. and you can make an argument like he's very versed on that. He'll go on and on and on, but at the end of the day, uh, where's the school? Right. Apparently, it's it's somewhat built, but it hasn't launched. Yeah, yet. but that's what I want to talk about. Yeah. That's where the where I support him and his thoughts. And I agree with that. We need more black schools. We need more black ownership in the community. We need to police our own communities. We're supposed to do that. If you ask me his agenda on what I want to talk about the most, it's that part of it. Mm -hmm. But the thing that he wants to talk about the most is black guys or shouldn't mix race. I'd rather talk about the school. Well, remember there was that video of him talking to that white girl at the mall. What happened to white girl? You've never seen this video? No. Here's a screen capture from it. And... What is he doing? Trying to get her to donate to the school? <laughs> uh, what is he trying to do? Trying to get her to donate? What? 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 Like, here, here's the here's the interaction right here. That looks like Hardy. I like he he he. Okay. They're like. But, so according to Umar, because he addressed this video, mm -hmm. he said that he was just passing through the mall and he was like at a, this kiosk and he was asking the girl about something about the kiosk and some people had like approached him and taking pictures with him and. 
you know, he had, the girl was like, oh, who are you? And he was like, oh, I'm on The Breakfast Club. Here, you can look it up on your phone. And, All right. You know, she was Googling him on, on YouTube. Or, and she didn't look, it, it, she wasn't shocked? I, I, I mean, listen, he claims he didn't do anything wrong. He claims that people send white girls at him to try to ham him up. Right. Uh, listen, we're all celebrities in our own way, and we know when women approach us and how do we, how we impress them. Oh, right. yes, I was just on The Breakfast But club. I'm saying that body- I have a new Netflix special. Go ahead that, and look it the, up. I mean- that That's body, what that looked like. That body- That's what that looked like. That body la- language looked very engaging. Yes. And especially as, as adamant he is about that, you would think the minute he saw a white chick, he'd be like, no, no. not today, devil. The stiff arm. Yeah, he had that. He was the Heisman. Looked like he had that smile, that smile where you know you might, it might start popping. It, with might, that, it ah. might pop off with this girl. You know, he got a little, you know, a little thick white girl here. I mean. Right. I mean, listen, I remember I had Aerie Spears on my show recently. He said the only way he's going to believe what Umar says is if a white girl gives him head and he stays soft. And that's impossible. <laughs> <laughs> I would say. I would tell you that that's, that is impossible. Impossible, huh? No, that is impossible. That is, it, that is impossible. I will just tell you this. I never had that experience. Never ever? Nah. Okay. <laughs> that's interesting. Right, because you talked about, uh, especially talked about reparations fucking? I just said, well, I, I just said that, like, there's, there's like, like guilt head is a motherfucker. Guilt head. Yeah, guilt. Someone that really is sorry. What their ancestors have done. They did. So they're they're gonna pay you back with some head. I'm telling you, that is uh it's a very interesting situation. And I can guarantee you you're not gonna stay soft. <laughs> when, you're not gonna stay soft. <laughs> was was somebody said, I'm sorry. <laughs> I watch Roots and I owe you. <laughs> and I'm gonna tell you something. Here's another phrase I don't know if Dr. Umar, and I'm gonna keep it 100 right now, right? Uh, I don't know if Dr. Umar ever heard this phrase. I wanna suck your big black cock. Yeah. That one right there will like, I'm not saying it's gonna second guess but you might you might put roots on pause for a second. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Ah oh, Big Black Cock. <laughs> What's your name? Ah oh, Big Black Cock. It's just the sound of that. You know what I'm saying? I'm not saying that everybody's gonna go for that. But there's some people, <laughs> some people with that phrase, they never gonna go back. Mm. What's your take on Umar saying that uh, Eminem can't be a top rapper? because he's not of African descent. Um, and he also said that a, a black person can't be the best at, you know, a Japanese art form or, a, you know, a Mexican well, that's art false. form. Anything, anytime black people do something, we take it over and we get nice at it. I mean, there's golf. We, was not, we got an example of it. Right. We got an example of it. Tennis. And we got golf, and I'm telling you that for the biggest, one of the biggest golf pros in the history of golf, has heard the phrase, I want to suck your big black cock. <laughs> <laughs> that was like a, is I that your wife saying, like someone else say that, Yeah, huh? big black cock. <laughs> I mean, Shaniqua ain't gonna never say that. She's like, I ain't nobody sucking your dick, but like. Well, nobody. remember when he got caught, it was all white girls. Of course Remember, it was, it was yeah. like 13 average looking white chicks. Yeah, you take big black cock and echo that shit. Big black cock, big black cock, big black cock. Big black cock, big black cock. I want to suck your big black cock. It's hard to back off of that shit. And then mind you, everybody, y'all do know that I'm a fucking comedian too. So I don't know, something about this chair, man. This was the truth chair before Club Shake Shake ever existed. Well, Eminem, he's saying Eminem can't be a top rapper because he's not black. Well, here's the thing. This is the opinion of Dr. Umar. Mm -hmm. Me personally, I can't focus on someone's opinion. I like to talk about things that fact, that's fact based. That's his opinion. Mm -hmm. There's some people that think he could be, and most of those are white people. And there's a lot of black people that say, all right, enough is enough. Let's admit that Eminem is a nice motherfucking rapper. And I will, I'll put it like this with Eminem. It was even tougher for him to get to the point where people even would mildly respect him and it to be straight because he's white. Mm. You know, he had to, like, 
I understand we, in certain fields and things, we broke the color barrier, but for him to break the black rap color barrier for people to even consider, nah, for, it took a long time. Fuck that white boy. Fuck mm. that white boy. It went from that to like, wait a minute, he's nice, he's nice and nice. But in some people's minds that he would never be able to be the all time greatest rapper. And to be quite honest, I don't give a fuck. Mm. I don't even fucking really listen to music at all. Mm. But there's some people that are stuck in the fact that they can't get over the fact this, that he's white and he's nice. There we have it. And you could also say that when he did a song with arguably the best rapper of all time, Jay-Z, right. he definitely held, held his own. And a lot of people even say he was better. But the whole thing that who's the best rapper, all that, when you start having those in your top fives, no discussion. You're, this who's this in your top five? We can make an argument forever, but it's all subjective on what you like. Mm. At the end of the day, yeah. what do you like? And at the, at the end of the day, if you like Jay-Z, you like Jay-Z. If you like Eminem, you like Eminem. But me being a, a motherfucker that's over 50, I don't even really have time to even argue about. It just makes no sense. And at certain topics, you know, there's never gonna be no resolve. Anyone's never gonna get an answer. Mm -hmm. I guarantee you, for the for the for the for the history of sports and everything, there's never gonna be an, a, an agreement on who is the greatest basketball player of all time. It's always gonna be LeBron, LeBron versus Mike. It's always gonna be Kobe. Uh, Kobe. It's yeah. always gonna be that. And it's a good it's a good talking point. You already have that conversation. But at the end of the day, you can put stats up. You can put like, well, this person did this. He did. He got this amount of rings. How many? Who did he play with? It's all stuff to 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 keep a conversation going that me personally, I don't give a fuck about. Well, and you especially said that Africans never blink. Um, from my experiences, from my experiences, <laughs> that like when they're upset, <laughs> they never blink. I when just think Michael money, Blackson. I'm, I'm thinking of Michael Blackson right oh, now. With this, yeah, you know, he never blink. I've never seen Michael Michael I don't think Blackson I've ever blink. Seen him blink. No, he and his eyes are always like really open like that. His eyes are open and I'm telling you what they never blink um, on 125th Street selling DVDs and Gucci watches and everything. <laughs> like, they don't never like... blink because they don't know when the cops are going to pull up. The cops are going to roll up and yeah. have all the bootleg gear. Yeah, it's wide, it's wide open. They never blink. You talked about how you had a young baby mother. Uh -huh. And when you said how young, you said that you were older than your baby mother's mother. I am. Yes. Uh. And then you start talking about how you are too rich and too famous to get a new old bitch. No, that's what I'm telling Here's what I'm saying. I'm like, <laughs> I don't care from the history of time, and I'm not saying illegal at the illegal stage. I'm not talking about the R. Kelly stage because when I ma met my baby mother, she wasn't underage. Yeah. She was a lot younger than me, but she was an adult. She yeah. wasn't living at home. She had experienced life and everything. Mm -hmm. And I don't give a fuck. I don't understand why people understand this. We like men like, like, they like younger chicks. I didn't, I didn't break no law. And it's just what it was. Right. And I didn't even expect me to be in a situation where that I was going to be part of this woman's life forever. But I also explained this. It's one thing, not to say that I couldn't be with an older woman. And I, and I even made this clear in my, in my, in, on my special. Me growing older with a woman is one thing. High school sweetheart, met when we 20 and been together 25 or 30 years, uh, I can understand that. And, but at my age, and at my age, especially when we met, it was, it was certain things that I hadn't done in life. And I like, I know that I probably wanted. And one of those was a kid. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So how old were you when you had your kid? Uh, 48. 48. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, I mean, if you look at the math, me being in a relationship with a woman the same age as I was when I had my son. At 48, she probably can't have kids. Can't? Very or risky. Doesn't want to, yeah. Doesn't want or, to. you're right, medically very risky. Oh, medically very risky. And also probably already- Had some kids. Already got kids. Our kids got kids now, you yeah. know? So that's something to be considered, considered with that, but you know. Well, yeah, I feel like the women are uh, cashing in on this now. You well, know, like, for example, way. Larsa Pippen, 49, Marcus Jordan, 33. Right. Uh, 
who else is there? Uh, Amber Rose. She got like a little young dude now. Uh, what's her name? Drea. Yeah, Drea that- got a baby with an NBA player who's like 22. Well, Drea still got it popping then. Yes, yeah, she does. But I tell, I know. Well, I mean, when you when you when you bring that up, then it's like it's 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 double, it's double standards. Mm. Because the first thing women say, they're like, "Wait a minute, y'all do the same thing." So um, I don't, I don't have no issue with it. Like, if you, man, I look at it like this: Cher, if, Cher is dating not, the Amber Rose's baby father. What? Yes, you didn't hear about this? No. Cher, who's 108 years old. I thought she was 105. She but looks, she doesn't she look great. over 95. She looks great for 105, but she's, right. you know, she looks 104. But I'm saying that her baby father looks like he's about 35. I no, no, that, her, no, her boyfriend. My bad, her boyfriend. I, and this is, this is Amber Rose's baby father. I think that uh, as a society, we so judgmental. I know this may sound crazy or whatever, but I, I know it sounds crazy. To each his own, if those two people don't have a problem with it and they're happy, uh, get down, have you get down. I'm sure the money kind of lubricates the situation a little bit, though. I'm just saying. She is 77. Right. Men been doing it all the time. Right. Men men been pulling out all the time. What's wrong with Cher or any of those women being sugar mama? Yeah, do your thing. I'm not mad at it, actually. I, I, I'm actually kind of cool. I'm totally cool with it. Right. Do your thing. But uh, I know that first thing you talk about, let, let, let's talk about that wheel. You know, they want to get that number like, well, in, in the event that something happens to you, and I think that's a conversation you have <laughs> the when will. a woman is like 80 or 85. You yeah, do remember Anna Nicole Smith? She, she got with like, a guy that was like 100, and he was like a billionaire. And But he, she, I don't think she ever got any money out of that situation, did well, she? Well, I think she did, and then the family fought her, and, and then got the back. money, they got it back. Yeah. So she never actually got it. And again, he was like, who cared? Nobody cared about his happiness. At the end of his life, they talked, they say all this shit, about him, whatever we'll say, but he's like this, I don't care what y'all say, I'm happy. Yep. Let's talk about the Chappelle show for a second. Right. Whereas where me and I think most of the rest of the world got introduced to you. You, you had done stuff up to that point, but the Chappelle show really, really put you on the map because you were such a central character all throughout the show. Right. When you got on the show initially, because were you, you were there on season one, right? Yes. When you guys were putting together season one, did you feel like you had something on your hands or is like- I knew it. You knew it. I knew it, but Dave and Neil, they didn't know it. And the reason why I say that, I think that was probably out of frustration. The name of Dave's uh, uh, production company is Polyboy Production. And the reason why it was Polyboy Production because uh, I think to the point before Chappelle aired, he had like 11 pilots. Yeah, I heard. Which is unheard of it. you like, usually you get one or two and they were like, okay, it didn't work out. But, you know, the industry loved Dave, you know, like he was the next guy, you know what I'm saying? He was young, he was smart, he was animated. He was that guy and it kept kept doing it, kept doing it. And I think that at some point, Neil and Dave were like, man, I don't know if this is ever gonna happen, you know? Which they had reservations about getting excited about this show because they had been in so many other situations where it didn't pan out like that, hmm. you know? Okay, so you guys do, you put the first season together. What are like the the main skits that you're on? Um, uh, uh, Ash, I don't know, first or second. Yeah, was Ashley Larry Ashley season La- one? I think Ashley Larry might've been, it's so hard, it's, so, it's been such a long time ago. Um, it might've been Reparations. Aha, right, that, that's that, what I'm rich, bitch. Yeah, it was, that was the, for me at the time, that was the biggest one. Okay. And Dave liked that sketch and the response of the, 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 the laughter it got so much that he put it at the calling card at the end of it. Exactly. And that's what really kind of resonated with people because it's one thing to do a sketch and then, you know, you got you, you see it when it airs and then you probably don't see it another three or four months, but to hear that phrase over and over again, that was a, a, a popular one. I don't know if Rick James came in the second season or whatever. No, that wasn't the first season. No, that was yeah, the first yeah, that season. Was, that was definitely not the first season. But to be quite honest, every... Every sketch I did, I popped. I popped right. it. Isn't it interesting, for example, the reparations skit, and now we have actual reparations conversations. Right. And people always reference back to the, the Chappelle show. Yeah. To the Chappelle show. That's that was the they, first time anyone's talked about reparations on television on any level. The, the, the interesting thing about that, 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 that scene was um, it almost got cut. Really? 
because when I was driving, when I was driving the truck, first of all, I didn't have a driver's license. We were so bootleg, <laughs> nobody vetted that. They was like, here go the truck keys, and nobody asked me if I, if I had a license or anything. We were in Harlem. We didn't have the type of budget where you could, um, we would just block off an entire block. We had to wait for the light to turn green and wait for the light to turn red. When I pulled up in the truck, I had to hit the spot, not knock over the, 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 uh, the actress that was playing the reporter, take the keys out of the car, and I had to say that line, but I kept messing it up. I kept messing it up until Neil Brennan uh, looked at me. He said, yo, B, um, uh, if you don't, uh, if we don't get this now, we're probably gonna scratch the sketch. Huh. So it was out of frustration that I, when I was, then I said, hungry it's bitch! It was completely <laughs> out of frustration. And after we did that, it was like, all right, we're keeping it. Well, remember, uh, Too Short had that famous line, on blow the whistle. What's my favorite word? Bitch. No, oh, but he say, said, I'm rich, bitch. He got it from me. He made $50 million. I'm proud of you, G. Right. But I don't know if... Did you get that from Too Short? Yeah, I, I know that phrase, but I don't know if... I don't know if that's truth that he got it from him. Hold on. Because that... Dave had a... Um, Dave had a bit... I'm sure Dave didn't get them from him. Yeah, he That's said, when, about my rich bitch. She got it from me and made $50 million. I'm proud of you, D. But I'm crazy. No, you don't want to be like me and come from East Oakland where the youngsters get high feet. But here's the thing. Tupac uh, was introduced to that phrase from the Chappelle show. But that particular line on rich bitch, it was a line that Dave did a, a special years ago called Trick Whitey, mm. where he was riding around and people thought... Um, he was he had a, a mask on like he was white, right? And everybody was treating him as uh, like like uh, was it like, that he was white. He was like trick whitey, right? And they was talking to him a certain way, and then he rips the mask off and he says, "I'm rich, bitch." Oh, okay. So it was I can understand where uh, Too Short thought that it was a rip or Dave got it from him, but that was probably four or five years before um, that even happened. Well, I think like Too Short just popularized bitch yeah. in like the hip hop circles. You know what I'm and saying? He like when he said bitch, like no one's really saying bitch. Like and he that. was, you gotta understand that Too Short was one of the first rappers. I believe he was the first West Coast rapper or very close to it. Definitely the first Bay Area rapper. Right. You know, th this was like the early 80s. So, you know, I think Too Short just wanted his props. And, you know, it is what it is. Yeah. Uh, you were on the Haters Ball. Right. as beautiful. Funny thing about me being on a haters ball was that that sketch was filled with so much hate that I wasn't even, even on the script. <laughs> what do you mean? The day before I asked Neil, I said, what's the next sketch I'm going to be on? He was like, player haters ball. I was like, cool. So I look at the call sheet and I didn't see me anywhere on the call sheet. I like. I said, yeah. I thought I was gonna be in player his ball. He said, Oh yeah, B. I'm sorry, I forgot. Right. This was the day before they they shot it. He said, Well, just come up with something. Beautiful wasn't on the script at all. So I went home. I was like, I wanted to change. I've all every sketch I made. You can see me with like no hair. Hmm. I was like, I want to do something different. I probably look like a character if I get a jury curl wig. I was like, I told him, I said, I want a bottle with jury curl fluid, but I want it in a champagne glass. And they were like this. <laughs> if you do that, it's going to be too sloppy. So I said, I, let me get an aerosol can that's wrapped in gold or looks platinum or something so I can squirt uh -huh. my hair. This wasn't on the sketch. I created the character the night before, right? And I was excited about it. I was like, oh, man, every time I punctuate something, I'm going to hit my, hit me two, hit me three times, bitch, or two times. Hmm. Get to set that morning, and they all look at me. I get dressed and everything. And Nils look at me like, what the fuck did you just do? And at that point, I still didn't have a name for the character, right? So I, I said, Neil, what's, what's my name? He was like, I don't know, just make up something. And I'm walking around, walking around, feeling all fly. And I looked in the mirror and I was like, God damn. I said, I feel beautiful. And it was like, ding, ding, ding. I said, I feel beautiful. I was like, that's it, beautiful. I went to Neil, I was like, beautiful. And he laughed. And that was the end. Every word that came in my mouth was an improv. And if you look at that sketch, really look at it, you saw... Um, Ice T, Patrice O'Neal, Charlie Murphy, mm. and um, and Rich Voss, right? And everybody went and took the podium, right? I never took the podium because I wasn't on the sketch. Mm. 
But I, and I even, even when the cameras wasn't on me, I shot out the, the, a line. I said, Silky, uh, uh, jacket is made out of 100% rat ass. Right? <laughs> and I said, if, uh, Silky, uh, mama got one big titty and one little titty, and they call her Biggie Smalls. <laughs> Hit me two times. I forced myself <laughs> on that show, 75% of the stuff I did, it was either improv or I forced myself in a sketch. And mm. the way I did that, I wasn't making a lot of money. I was still a come up comic at the time. So I used to go to, I used to go on set when uh, I was off just cause I knew I was gonna get some free food. And I knew that <laughs> there was a chance that they would call me in to do a sketch. Um, Black Bush, I wasn't in that sketch. I just happened to be hanging out. Mm. Uh, the Wayne Brady sketch uh, when I was like, oh, when they, um, when uh, at the end when Wayne Brady says it's Wayne Brady bitch and shoots up the club. <laughs> I was in my regular civilian clothes. Neil Brennan comes up to me, he says, Donnell, you wanna get shot? Very interesting question to ask a black man. <laughs> Neil's white, by the way. <laughs> of course, right? And, but I was like, yeah. We did it in one take. It's Wayne Brady bitch. And I, I was like, oh shit, I fell back and my jacket got caught on to the, to the, to the, to the, to the window whatever it was. And I was just shaking. Nobody said cut. And there was like, that was it. It was one take and I was gone. Well, the show was great. And it had a, a cult following. It was definitely great. 22, 21 years later, we still talking still about talking it. still talking about 21 it. 21 years later, it's still one of the, some of the biggest memes. Exactly. Whenever you see something that punctuates laughter, you got me and Charlie Murphy laughing. It was just one of those shows that do I want to continue? Do I want to talk about Chappelle's show 21 years later? No, but was I part of some history yeah. and created iconic characters? There's no way around it. Well, what I was going to say was, the show had a real cult following, but then when the Charlie Murphy True Hollywood Stories dropped, I felt that it went to a whole different place. You felt it. Here's another thing, a fact people don't know. And it was one of the reasons why whenever I came on the scene in the sketch, people went berserk. Because I was the warm-up comic for the show. Mm. I was a guy, before the show started, I was a guy, yo, Donnie, go out there, get these people ready. So I would go out there before Dave came out or anybody. I would go out there. I'd do 15, 20 minutes worth of comedy, crowd wow. work. So I had to, I, I would have the crowd amped before the show even started. That's why when you saw me come on, if you see the Ashley Larry character, whenever you see me, they starting to clap already. The characters wasn't established then. Mm. They were clapping because, oh shit, that was a guy that just destroyed the room. Now he's on the sketch. It was that was calculated on my part. I was like, go hard. So the smallest role, anything they see me on, they're gonna go, they're gonna go crazy. And another thing, I during the warm-up, first off, Comedy Central didn't like that sketch. Really? They thought it was too long. Not in the history of sketch comedy on TV, that you had a sketch that was pretty much the whole episode. Mm. That was damn near 20 minutes. And on TV, you only got 22 minutes of show. You know what I'm saying? That if it did that, that was the whole sketch. And secondly, they didn't think Charlie Murphy was funny. Well, to be fair, that was sort of the introduction to Charlie Murphy. You no, didn't know we who did. he, really, most people didn't know who he was. He was a no. relatively I understand he's Eddie Murphy's brother. And right. he became he got into his own after that. But at that time No, they didn't think he was funny watching it. So, period, just as a... No, they didn't think he was funny. I understand what you're saying. Yeah. They didn't think he was funny watching it. Aha. Like, before we even go to showing these skits, skits to the public, they got to go through the suits. Right. And they was like, oh, whatever. But when we were doing it, me, I was in the room every time, and I was like, oh, we got something special. The first time, man, when Dave said, I'm Rick James, bitch, and that audience went crazy. I was like, man, this show is about to skyrocket. Yeah. Yeah, and the Rick James episode is what skyrocketed. Yeah. But were you in the Rick James uh, episode? Yeah, I played, it was a one scene where, uh, this is so interesting, it was one scene where, um, what did the five fingers say to the face? Yeah. Bah! I'm Rick James, bitch. I was- At the China Club. Yeah, I was at one of Charlie's boys then, right? Aha. And it was so funny, because I was so used to just throwing out lines, and they would make it. I would just improv, and they'd make it. 
And that day, it was so funny because I told Neil, I said, um, I'm, they didn't mic me up. He said, oh, you're not saying nothing. I was like, suppose I want to say, so he was like, you're not saying nothing. But I was like, okay, if you're not going to give me the mic, I'm going to be so expressive that you know that I was there. And even when, when he said, I'm Rick James, bitch, and then when he smacked him, if you look at my face, you could see me say, what the fuck? <laughs> they didn't mic me, but I was like, what the fuck? I made the camera come to me. Uh. And like, and, and, and even the character Ashley Larry, whenever, if you if you take an editor and ask him just to cut out everything that Donnell was in, probably it's only going to total four minutes of actual time speaking. Aha. So I always knew that I had to go deeper. I had to make these characters funny before I even said anything. The character Ashley Larry, he wasn't Ashley. He was just a guy with shorts and socks and dress shoes. But I said, I wanted to, I said, I got to do something to make people laugh immediately. I said, I want to be so ashy that I could write how much money people, <laughs> how much money people owe me on the side of my leg, right? <laughs> and I didn't tell anybody because I knew they was going to say no. So I went to the wardrobe, I mean, uh, with hair and makeup. And I'm like, yo, man, just give me some baby powder. I put the baby powder on. They didn't know what I was looking like. I had a robe on, right? And I said, give me some powder for my hands. So when I, as soon as they saw me, they was like, what the fuck? It was too late. They was about to say action. <laughs> right? And uh, they didn't even have dice on that set. So I was like, man, just give me some powder. So I'm shaking the powder like this, right? Nobody knew what I'm going to do. Because if you show too early, you be like, that's stupid. It's going to be messy. I shook my hand with that baby powder in. <sighs> when I blew that shit out, <laughs> it was lights out. <laughs> It was like my special. It was a new day. It was a new dawn. Mm, yeah. It was over. And Ashley Larry was born. And he's been an iconic character for like the last 20 years. Well, then there was the Prince kit. And that way, I feel like that completely solidified the show. 100%. Once you had the Rick James skit and the Prince skit and everything else, all the, all the guests and, and everything, it was like, all right, this is now, this show's out of here. Yeah, and it wasn't like it was. It wasn't like a skit. It was recreating the story. Exactly. And Charlie had a million of them stories, and like we would be like, "Come on, nobody believes that." And it sound, sound it's, it sounded so crazy, but I'm telling you, that was pretty much the birth. All that the, the Rick James sketch, it was a birth of Charlie Murphy having his name. Yeah. Because for years he was just Eddie Murphy's brother. And that's one of the things in his death, the one of the things that I really think that the show gave him was a sense of identity. Oh yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like when he passed away, nobody was saying Eddie Murphy's brother passed away. I said Charlie Murphy passed away. Charlie Murphy. So our, uh, rest in peace. I, lo I love that guy to miss him, but that's one thing I say, if that show did anything, it gave him who he was. And he was a great guy. Yeah, man, I got to hang out with him. I got to interview him. Uh, I remember he told me, I asked him, when did you know that those Charlie Murphy true Hollywood stories were going to react? He said, we took the tapes to his brother Eddie Murphy's house and they played it. And Eddie watched it and he said, brilliant. And they Love looked it. at each other and they were like, wow, okay, we got something on our hands. Eddie right. Murphy, who's, you know, most people he talked to was the rock star of of comedy. You know, the, the greatest comic churned actor, you know what I mean? It's interesting, because I have a Charlie Murphy, Eddie Murphy story. Okay. Uh, me and Charlie were doing comedy, we were on the road together, right? And Charlie used to come see me, do, Charlie used to, not on the road, we weren't on the road yet, but he used to see what I used to do doing the warm-ups and everything, right? And he was raving about me to Eddie. He was like, yo, this motherfucker is, is funny. He's this and that and everything. It was like, uh, Charlie was like, Donnell, 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 Donnell. And I think about it, that, that, that I had did an a, a episode of a, a Apollo Comedy Hour, right? And I didn't really have that greatest set on there. And Charlie had Eddie sit around like, yo, you got to check this motherfucker out. He's a shit. And I don't want to say I bombed, but it wasn't. <laughs> it wasn't enough for, Eddie didn't say, brilliant or genius, right? <laughs> he was like, man, get this shit out of here, right? And oh man, to this day, man, I was like, man, I need another shot of that. I wish he could see. I'm pretty sure at some point he's seen something to work, but you know, for, I was like, you know, first thing, 
I was like this. I was like, yo, show, look, tell him I'll come on. Show, show. And what did he say? He was like, he said, get that shit out of here. <laughs> <laughs> that will give you incentive to go harder. Uh, well, and you guys actually got to to really reprise a lot of these characters on Saturday Night Live. Yeah. And this was, I remember me and uh, me and Dave were texting around this time and he was like, yeah, he just wanted to do the show because Tribe Called Quest was reuniting. And right. that just kind of brought in the whole idea of, oh, let's just redo a bunch of the Chappelle show yeah, skits and everything. So what was that like after was all awesome. those years? It was awesome. It just really showed you. But one thing, we, we, when we did uh, Chappelle show, we had like a very skinny budget, right? So when me and Dave first went on like on location for what was going to be <clears throat> bringing those characters back, I mean, we saw it was probably like about 80 people on the set, hmm. 90 people on the set. I was since probably like 15 to 20. Perfect. And they had all the state of the art shits. And Dave was walking around like, damn, boy, imagine if we had this type of money, <laughs> you know? And it was like, and I was, it was interesting to see we hadn't worked together like that like in a while but you could tell the excitement of uh the staff and everything but you still can't you couldn't feel how people were going to respond to it because you were in the moment mm -hmm. until you sit back and you watch it and then i mean it was just like Chappelle show the minute you saw those characters everybody went goddamn crazy so much that the second year we did it again and it was the same response. Mm -hmm. And if people laughed at the stuff that made it onto NBC, the shit that didn't make it. Oh, there was more. Oh my God, this, they cut out what I consider some of the funniest stuff. Huh. You're dealing with a different situation. You're dealing with network television. You're dealing with standards and practices. You know, they can't take too much of a chance. And then for the most part, when you have a writing staff that large, they're not excited about you doing a lot of improv. It takes away from what they do every day, you know? So they wasn't really embracing the things that we said, cause it was like, shit, I didn't write that. Why I'm gonna let, you know, that happen. But it just, it, it, it was th those couple of times that it made me think like, what if we were to do like a anniversary special? What if we would do something mm. like that? But I don't think that, um, I don't think that it would work. I think that time has passed. I think that uh, Charlie Murphy not being it, but I did pitch an idea today. I was like, you know, what if we did, um, we such haters, what if we did a sketch where it was uh, 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 Buck Nasty's funeral? Huh. Right? Which is Charlie Murphy's character. Charlie Murphy character, yeah. right? And we in there hating on his funeral. <laughs> Right, it brought, it so brought I'm all the bad shit he yeah, did. It brought, yeah, he it was always a, a bitch. It, it brought out a little chuckle in him, but I remember I was on the road with him once, and he was like, "Man, if I still had the show, I was like, you can get the show." And I think he was going to say no to the Chappelle show. Yeah. Seriously, and right? I think, in 2024. I think, and I think Netflix is—they really would love for him to do it again, but it's just tough. It's long hours, and sometimes I think some things are just just left. Just leave them alone. You know, let it be a part of history and just keep it moving. I mean, in retrospect, with so many decades that have passed, why do you think that Dave walked away at the height of the show? Because it was on its way to being the biggest thing on television. I really do, but people won't understand this, but I really never knew the answer to that. So all the times you guys spent since then and all the shows you guys have done together. We don't and talk about it. Just don't talk about it. We don't talk about the shit. And then I remember after, I, when I saw him, like maybe some years after um, he left, I wasn't like, where'd you go? Why'd you go there? Because I know that question, that was a, one of the biggest news stories in comedy and entertainment. I'm like, how many times has he answered this question? And I was more focused or concerned about being a, a good friend, comrade, than, all right, why'd you do this or anything like that? Yeah, it's just one of those things that's going to go down in history. And, you know, I, I think that it it set a uh, a bar for a lot of people. I remember uh, when Nick Cannon was going to leave, um, I forgot what show, uh, America's Got Talent. Mm -hmm. I remember he called me and he was saying, like, well, you know, because Dave left at that point and he's viewed a certain type of way and I'm thinking about doing the same thing. So a lot of people after that compared themselves but to him can. doing that. But there was so much money involved in everything. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, you can't. Like, I think Gerard Carmichael was like that. You just can't. It's like, it's only going to be one day. Yeah. It's only going to be one one 
Dave Chappelle. It's going to be only one guy that has that type of character that's really willing. There's not too many people that's going to walk away from $50 million. Listen, Period. I was up on Chappelle way before the Chappelle show. So when the show came around, I was like, oh, I've been watching this guy already. Great. But, you, but if you think about that, you know, Dave has always been accepted in mainstream. You know what I'm saying? There's a certain class of people that always fucked with him. And one of them was like, and, and, and to be quite honest, it wasn't, it, it took a while for the streets, for Dave to resonate with the streets. Not uh, Nutty Professor, they was warming up. Uh -huh. Because people like, and I'm saying a lot of, a lot of like, like some people feel like, they felt like, oh, he's, I know it sounds weird, or he's too smart. Hmm. Uh, his comedy makes you think. Some place they don't want to think. They want just the craft in your face stuff. And that's what always separated him. He never compromised his style to try to sue anybody. He was always a smart comic. He never was a guy that, you know, went to just do the dick and pussy jokes just to get people laughs. But I really believe that that show resonated in the hoods. And I think that's when, like, he always had a group of people. But I think that's when the world came along and said, oh, this is the guy. And I'm pretty sure he was like, I've been this motherfucker. Y'all just didn't catch up. You know? Well, yeah, man. And it was it was great because since you and I did our last interview, which I think probably about 10 years ago or something, um, you got to see Dave come back at the highest level. Was but he started dropping those Netflix specials? You know what I'm saying? Because he had been... Yeah, but, but he, was, he, was, but, but he wasn't in the public eye. But at the same time, he was still doing comedy shows. Right, but not on the level of these like, Netflix yeah, specials. That's all, all I'm saying. He was still... I was going to his shows. Right. Right? But... Once those Netflix specials came around, time. and then you start hearing the money behind it and everything, it's like, oh, okay, this guy's now essentially the king of stand-up comedy right yeah. now. He was. It, it was, still it is. was dope to see. Yep. Were you there when he got attacked on stage? I wasn't. I did every show but that show. But that show. <laughs> oh, my God. I was on a flight going to Atlanta, and I wanted to jump off that bitch, man. <laughs> Because I was still at that point where you take off on the plane and you can still get reception and shit. All I heard was like, what the fuck? Dave just got attacked on stage. I'm like, ah, emergency exit. I'm Jump like, out the window. Yeah, I was like, ah, man. No, I did every show but that show. Yeah, I remember his last stand-up. He was like, the media, like, reporter. I was like, Dave was allegedly attacked. He's like, allegedly? Allegedly, no, he was like attacked. <laughs> he was attacked, attacked. You know? I mean, it's interesting how the whole trans, you know, backlash thing. When I watched that first thing talking about how his trans friend committed suicide from the bullying, I'm like, oh, like this is actually a very heartfelt story. But this is somehow being painted as a negative thing. The reason why, because a lot of people didn't listen to the whole story. Just a little clip. They use listen to yeah. the clip. I have a, 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 a lesbian married couple friends of my. I don't know if I said that right or whatever, in Texas, and they came to the show. One of them I've been known for years. Her wife, I just was introduced, and I was like, "Come to the show." This girl woman has been coming to my shows forever. I was like, "Come to the show," and then um, after the show, I called her. Right, I was like. How'd you like the show? She was like, well, blah, 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 blah. Didn't really like the show. We left. And when she told me that, I was like, I know exactly the moment you left. Hmm. When he started, some people were just waiting to be triggered. When he started that story, that's when she left. I was like, that's unfortunate because if you listen to the whole thing, you'll see how can you be mad at that? But now we live in a world where people love to, they just want to be triggered. People want to be upset about something. You know, and then when that when that happened, she left. She was upset. I was like, y'all should come back. We was there again. I was like, you know, maybe like a month ago. And he was just working on his set, and they came back, and she was listening to the whole show, and then like she apologized. She was like, mm. I didn't give it a fair shake. And I think a lot of people in that community that were like super super upset. Don't didn't give it the fair shake. We 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 love clickbait. Mm -hmm. We love like we don't want we don't want to investigate a list of the whole thing. We just want to take the headlines and judge it. Judge whether it's from that. But I don't think that's fair. I agree. I agree. And we've all gotten caught up in these partial clips. I know I have. Right. Where you watch it, it looks a certain type of way, but you don't see the before and after and then 
now you're spouting off a bunch of shit that's not accurate. Yeah, so. and you're not giving it a fair shake. Yeah, and then, and then, then like, even when circle I go back and say my bad, and yeah. It's another thing, but another thing too is like, um, the, um, media is driven off of negativity as of late. If you get, if you, and that's the most interesting story. I don't think it's as of late. I think media has forever, always, forever. That's why you don't hear no good news. Only time you hear good news is in the morning. <laughs> right, good day. Listen to the words. Good day, New York. And then it's over. You don't say. And then it's all about the bombs and the and shootings. Then even even and the... the music. Good day, New York. And then at night is the night news. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's the like, murders tonight. <laughs> yeah. Like, uh, Another five school people killed in the Bronx. Over in Brooklyn, ten people killed. You know. But if you guys, and I tell people this all the time, with any of his specials, or any of like some of the material that I do, if you take a hundred people, you ask them how they felt about it. You might have three people that was like, oh, it was trash or whatever. Then you have 97 people that like it. But the story's not going to go to the 97. The story's going to go to the, the three people because that is a more engaging, compelling story for people to talk about. And it's unfortunate, but that's what it is. But also I think cancel culture is starting to flip because motherfuckers bitch about shit so much that people are getting frustrated. They're saying, shut the fuck up. Yeah. What else do you want these comedians that's supposed to tell their truth or talk about what they want to talk about? What the fuck else do you want them to do? Well, the Cat Williams thing happened, which right. created kind of a divide in the comic community. Right. Uh, Chappelle even said, how come Cat didn't call out any white boys, any white comedians? Right. What's your take on that whole thing? The Cat Williams thing? Yeah. I think that it was, um, I think that the conversation that Cat Williams had with uh, Shannon Sharp He's probably been having locker room talk with his friends and close people forever. Yeah, like definitely. oh yeah, fuck this motherfucker, fuck that. I can't believe this. And then a lot of it is like I understand in his and it's his truth. Something triggered. It was enough. I guess he had a, a moment. Enough is enough. Fuck that. I'm gonna go up here. And then when he went up there, he just started just assassinating motherfuckers. <laughs> I mean, it was people get. They say, damn, how did so and so catch us straight? You know, what happened to this person? I don't really have a major opinion of it because it's such a risky thing to talk about because it doesn't matter how you try to explain it to anybody. People that align themselves with him, whatever, it's nothing. And this is what makes him an underground or a street legend. The people that fuck with him are super loyal. Mm -hmm. And if you don't agree with everything he says, then you're a sellout. <laughs> you ain't shit. You probably gonna suck a dick. You know what I'm saying? You're gonna wear a dress. If you don't agree with everything he say, you are the problem. Yeah. And I've dealt with a whole bunch of fan bases, the uh, Nicki Minaj, the Barb's. Yeah, uh, I've dealt with them before too. Yeah, they go hard. Oh yeah, they, they do. won't stop. I just said I'm sorry. <laughs> Taylor, Taylor Swift, Swifties, they wasn't that bad. Once I learned one of her songs, they accepted me. Mm. You know, you got Beyonce, Beyonce, but there is no group of fans that are as loyal and as gangster as I call them, the Kitty Cats. The, that's Cat Williams fans? The yeah, kitty cats? I mean, I named it the Kitty Cats. <laughs> the Kitty Cats. You know, no disrespect. Listen, I got to apologize for the name I came up with. The Kitty Cats. <laughs> the Kitty Cats. Because no matter what you say, it's like, this is their phrase. Where's the lie? He didn't lie. Where's the lie? He didn't lie. Uh, okay. Well, why didn't anybody say anything? He didn't lie. The reason why nobody, why ain't nobody say nothing to say nothing about it? because they know they can't fuck with the kitty cats. Okay, so I just had Michael Blackson on here. Mm -hmm. And he said that Cat Williams lied so well that he thought it was actually the truth. He said, most comedians don't get booed enough. This is how you wind up with a Michael Blackson, who's a real African doing a fake African accent. He said that he gave you the best advice of your life and said that you used to wear dirty daishikis <laughs> and you should dress to be in the position that you're trying to be in. And he also said that if you're trying to be the king of African comedy, you should open a school in Africa. <laughs> said that you took his advice, changed your whole persona, <laughs> and then hated him for it. <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you about Cat. Cat lies so well, right? That he almost made me believe what he said about me was true. That's how good of a lie this guy is. <laughs> At one point. Well, because he was like, you know, because there was a bunch of, oh, uh, Michael Blackson has a fake African accent. Uh, I told him to build that school. Like, he was like, yo, but Michael Blackson doesn't is... have a fake African accent. <laughs> no, no, he does not. 
What? I just interviewed him. And I hung out with him afterwards. He may accentuate, accentuate it, maybe in certain skits. You know what you want to hear is? You're saying he has a ra- He's from Africa. He just became a U.S. Mike, citizen. and no district, man, fuck that. I'm just saying this. Mike, you know why you never seen him with his, without his African accent? Because you never talked to him about money. What? Talk to him about his money. <laughs> I seen him go back to his motherfucking Philly voice. Motherfucker don't get right with his money. He be like, he not gonna be like, where's my money, buddy? Fuck. He gonna be like, yo, nigga, where the fuck is my money? <laughs> oh, man. Okay, I'm just gonna leave that one alone, son. The fact that you, oh, man. You gotta talk talk to Mike about some money. You're saying he has a fake African accent. Am I saying he has a fake accent? Uh, yes. No, okay. What I'm saying is- I, I'll face out right no, now, man. No, no, <laughs> no, no. What I'm saying is, okay, okay, not fake Af- African accent. I'll just put it like this. He- knows how to use his accent. Correct. He's right. a comedian. Right. Right? Yeah. He plays characters. Yeah, but- He came out playing the African guy at the CD store. Yeah. Right, in the daishiki. Yeah. But he he doesn't speak with an American accent like you and I. I came over when I was four. You say he has a perfect American accent. You can't tell he's African when he speaks. I'm about to face. Hold on a second. That I can't get him fucking, up. That is the funniest shit. That is the funniest uh, shit listen, that you think. Yo, we hung out with him afterwards. Like, we did a whole feature on his car, like, just hanging out. Just his fiance was there. We were, like, the three of us were just talking. It was the same accent that was in the interview. Now, does he, yeah, play, that's it, what, does he play it up on stage bank, a little go bit? To, go, uh, go to the bank with him. <laughs> he'll, turn, he'll, turn, turn, he'll turn all American at the bank yo Mike Blackson sounds like a straight Philly nigga right, and man. I ain't blowing him up and I ain't trying to throw him on a bus or anything but that motherfucker I seen somebody fuck his money up and I saw the Philly come out of him <laughs> I'll just leave it at that well Michael Blackson the only thing true about what, what Cat Williams said was that uh, Steve Harvey has a wig Tell me some of the truths that he said that you're like, okay, yeah, that's true. I mean, uh, Steve Harvey had a wig. That's probably true. <laughs> was that an I actual mean, wig? Uh, it was like a hair transplant or nothing? No, nah, that was like a black loofah he had on his head. A black loof. <laughs> <laughs> Steve Harvey barber used to bring the hair to the shop. Hey, let's go. This is the hair you're going to wear today. Just put on his head like a crown. Uh, this here you go. Um, go ahead. You ready? Yeah, well, Steve Harvey did. Well, no, they said a, a man unit. Yo, which is a wig. Yeah, it's a wig. Yeah, back then, you, you, there, no man, no man in their forties is going to have a fucking kid and play, <laughs> fucking haircut. Oh, this hairline was, was precise. It not was at, perfect. Not at no forty something. I don't give no. a fuck what nobody say. Right. Not at no forty something. But then, I mean, but that's just Hollywood. That's just Hollywood. They, Hollywood wants you to stay young. Like right now, it's weird for me not to have my beard dyed right now. Right. The Hollywood rule is that you can't sell gray, but I'm not dealing with ageism and I'm going to be who I want to be. But I mean, no, that was a, there's nothing wrong with it. But at some point he was like, you know what? The maintenance on this thing, enough is enough. And I want to be who the fuck I am. And it didn't change it. I don't know if when he took it off his, his career, um, Skyrocketed, but he yeah. embraced it and he get money being both. But that's the toughest. That's the toughest thing for an artist or actor or comedian in Hollywood is to get older. People think you're getting old. When I'm like, just be whoever you are. Well, one of the things that came up was the whole stealing of jokes, right? Which is actually ironic because right before that interview came out, I interviewed Carlos Mencia, mm-hmm. who I believe is the only comic who got legitimately canceled for stealing joke accusations. Oh yeah, he did. It definitely affected his career. Oh, 100%. Remember, he was right there. Matter of fact, the Chappelle show and the Carlos Mencia, the minor Mencia were almost like they're supposed to be paired together. One after another. Do you remember working with Carlos during that time? I didn't work with him, but I know that that show was like... It was like right there, though. It was like adjacent. Yeah, it was like... It was like Comedy Ruff. Central. It was the same network and everything. I know. Yeah, but they, that was a big deal. That was a big deal. I mean... Uh, that was probably one of the, like, we think we got beef over here on the black side. That Carlos Mencia, Joe Rogan beef went forever and ever. Yeah, still go. I mean, it went to a point where Joe Rogan stopped going to the comedy store. Like, he was really serious about it. Mm-hmm. And then at that time at the comedy store, Carlos Mencia was favored there. Huh. You know what I'm saying? And, and Joe Rogan didn't go over there for a very, very long time. That's the issue. But they say, not that 
subscribe to this, but they say that um when I was when I started, it was an unwritten rule, and we knew people out there still. But like there was like there's to be there's no way you could copyright a joke or anything like that. So the rule was it's not really your joke until you put it on TV. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Okay, so if you're just doing it in clubs, it's I'm not free, saying it's, it's a free right, for all. But I'm just no, saying, but that's just the reality of it. Yeah, that's reality. Like fuck you, what you gonna to people that stole it? Like what you gonna fuck you gonna do about it? And certain people like and I I had a a a, a, a period in my career where I was like. I was all about, he a joke thief, he a joke thief, he a joke thief. Oh, you felt people were stealing your jokes? I know people were stealing my jokes. Like, who stole your jokes? I'm not going to say who stole my jokes. Famous comedians? Um, they are famous now. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? But what they did bigger than that stole my joke, they, but they're stealing jokes, they stole my mannerisms. They stole how I delivered a joke. They stole my huh. style. You know what I'm saying? The way I do my voice, they stole characters and stuff. You know, but I, I, I'm from old school. And like, back then, if you steal somebody's joke, you just beat them up. <laughs> I mean, what you weren't going to take them to court. Have you had altercations with people over stealing jokes? Um, I have not stolen jokes, but I had altercations with people in clubs and stuff, but not stealing, not stealing, not 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 stealing jokes. But back then, we like we would just, you know, motherfucker would fuck somebody up. Mm. You know, that was it. But this is how I feel about it. Thinking past that, you can lose so much time and energy focusing on that, right? I believe this, if a person can really steal your joke, it's probably not the best joke you could write. Good point. Like who doesn't have, and certain jokes are just so easy to, like a joke about being poor in the Halloween costumes you wore. Right. Like it's so easy to hit that premise. Even me as a young comic, I had a joke about we were so poor, I had a Halloween costume. It was made out of five superheroes. <laughs> I was Spider-Man by the face. I was a hawk in the arms. I had Batman legs. That is not an original premise. Yeah. That's something easy to hit. But me telling the story about losing my son at Orange County Fair and all the things I had to do to find him or whatever, that's something that's close to me. And real good, like, really, 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 really good comics, it's kind of hard to steal the material, especially it's, if it's your life. Mm. And when people were stealing, would, would take jokes of me, when I was like, you know what? I got to come up with something that's unstealable. And the only thing about that, a motherfucker can't steal your life. Well, I brought this up to TK Kirkland who's older than all of us. I stole somebody's joke before. Yeah? And I, but I called him and told him. Who was it? It was Rich Voss. Okay. And I'm not proud to say this, but I was a young comic. I had no more jokes left. <laughs> and I was eating it. I didn't have nothing. I was like, who shit I can use that get me out of this situation right now? <laughs> Rich Voss. And Rich Voss had a joke, and I called him and I told him. He had a joke. Um, what did he say? Uh, it was like about a... Um, Interracial lecture, he said, uh, my sister, um, my sister was dating a black guy, and, and they and they said, you know what they say, once you go black, you can't go back. He said, yeah, because dad won't let you back in the house. <laughs> and I was in a crunch situation. I needed something to get these motherfuckers off of me, right? And as soon as I did the joke, I caught Rich. I was like, man, I'm sorry, man, but I had to borrow, that still. Borrow. I had to borrow and acquire that joke just for that moment. Uh. It was like, no problem. Well. I mean, when I brought this up to TK, he said this. He said, number one, stealing a joke is very different than stealing a set. Right. In a set, you're gonna doing you're doing 20, 30 jokes. Right. A joke might be 30 seconds, it might be a minute and a half, then you right. go on to your next joke. And he considers the whole thing just petty. I, w I agree with him 100%. Yeah. And then here you go, the best joke writers don't get paid because of one joke. They get paid because when this when they say no to this joke, they got another one. You say no to this joke, I think it's petty. And then I'm telling you, I've lost some time and some energy just worrying about that. You know, fucking either fuck them up, write another joke. Right. I mean, because he even pointed out, TK pointed out that, you know, his famous phrase, who raised you, Cat Williams used it in his stand-up. Yeah. And he was like, all right, who cares? 
Yeah, who cares? So what? But so then, you, but it's a, but it's so. But that's what when you see an original, original comic, you you know what makes them original because they're not yeah. talking about what everybody talking about. When you start talking about topical stuff, it's gonna be hard to protect that because people think the same. Even on my special, I did a joke about the Alabama brawl. You know what I'm saying? I'm pretty sure everybody has an Alabama brawl joke. But my twist was igniting the civil rights movement. But then somebody else might have that. But stuff like that, that's just a warm-up joke. That's just something that's topical that gets me going to go to the other stuff. Right. I mean, for example, your comedy special, I've never heard anyone say that gay black men have the best potato salad. I've never heard that before. You've never had gay black potato salad. I don't think I have. You know, but I, but even with that, <laughs> and even like in, in, in uh, that was a funny joke. Yeah. That's a funny joke. It's a funny joke, but I'm not going to talk about that because it's probably still some people that haven't seen the special. Well, once this comes out, but it's still the special be, will be out. I know, but it, was, but it could come from Oh, anywhere. I see what you're saying. Yeah, there'll still be yeah. some people that haven't seen the special. <laughs> I'm not saying, I'm not just going to assume that the whole world is going to see it on that day, you know? But I'll just tell you, the thing that I really enjoy about the special is that I push it, but not too far. You know what I'm saying? It's it's edgy, but not too edgy. Mm -hmm. But the thing that I like the most about this special is that people, um, it feels good. You know what I mean? It's fun to watch. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? It's a, it's a fun special to watch, and I hope people keep watching it. Well, yeah, I mean, it's interesting how many of my regular guests are kind of falling under this Chappelle executive producer umbrella. Like, you know, you, but there's also Lunell. It was only four of us. Earthquake. And Tony Woods. And Tony Woods. Yeah, Tony Woods. Ah, Tony. okay. So that's the only person I haven't interviewed. Yeah, it was it was four people. And then I, one thing I, I, I appreciate about, I appreciate about that the most is that, you know, Dave has the power to uh, get uh, people to look at people that, that for the most part have been passed over or just haven't been seen in a certain light. That's what the home team series was all about. It was about, you know, the everybody that's, that that he chose to produce a special has at least 30 years of experience. And for some reason they wasn't getting the looks. And everybody, uh, Earthquake had a special before. Yeah. Lunell had a special before, but to be on the largest platforms for specials, it was a big deal. Have you ever uh, seen Earthquake read? Because according to Cat Williams, he can't read. Yes, I've seen him read. We did. We did. I know. That's so funny. I've seen him. I've seen him read, and I know he read. I know he read. I've sent him text messages. Unless he got someone to help him reply, I, I think he can read. No. It, he used like, to be in the military. He used to look over nuclear missiles. But not just I don't look think they let an illiterate person do this. But not just look over nuclear missiles before, but he was in the Air Force. They consider that to be the most uh, intellectual branch in, in, the, in, right. in, in, the, um, in the military side. And you have to... They got what you call an ASVAB test. The ASVAB test is like the PS, uh, uh, like, um, uh, uh, what is that fucking? Um, All right, because you were in the military yourself. Yeah, we were in the same for, for how For how long? Uh, was it four years. Four years, okay. Yeah, I did four years, I got out. Um, um, the ASVAB test is what test you have to take to qualify for a certain job or even to enter in the military. And everybody, like the Air Force was probably, again, they considered the most intelligent branch. So you're not getting, and, and especially the branch of the Air Force, you're not getting in the Air Force without, not, without being able to read. I've worked on sets with, um, with, with um, Earthquake where we had scripts and we read against each other, we mm. read with each other. So, you know, that's kind of like, that's kind of false. And I think it's like unfortunate to uh, try to even put that out there. You know what I'm saying? If you get upset because people think that you might have issues with drugs or whatever like that, and that has been, people have said those things, then you got to feel like a motherfucker will have issues by you trying to say a motherfucker is illiterate. What's interesting about the military, because we actually just did an interview today with uh, Army sniper Nicholas Serving. So I was going through the whole military research. Military recruitment is at an 80 year low right now. Right. And you know the biggest group of people who has the historically lowest percentage ever in the military? White. White people, yep. Yeah. You're right. There's less white people in the military, percentage-wise, than ever in the history of the U.S. There's less white people, but the white people are the most patriotic. That's an interesting point. It's a With real, all of the MAGA guys and everything else like that, none of them are actually joining the military. But the ones that go into, they are really in the military to protect and serve this country. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, white people go to protect and serve. Black people go for the benefits. <laughs> That's a known 
fact. <laughs> you went for the benefits? Uh huh. 100%. You think I ran, went in the military to protect you? <laughs> You think if we was actually in a war situation, I'm like, yo, Flair, get out. I'm going to save you. No, you dead. If I'm dead, you dead. If I'm wounded, you're wounded, motherfucker. We're wounded. Man, I am not. All those pictures where you see a white person, like somebody on his shoulders and taking them off, it's white people, bro. It is not black people. And when I was in the military, man, we used to have exercises where you simulate war. I got killed in every exercise. <laughs> the minute the exercise kicked off, I was dead. Right. And the reason why, because when you get killed in the fake war as an exercise, they got to take you off the field. <laughs> and when they take you off the field, you know, they take you to the basketball gymnasium. <laughs> so it didn't take black, black soldiers too long to realize I'm going to get killed and we about to play a three on three. <laughs> Yo, the white dude's like this, protect the base! And no, and the black dude's like this, I got next, motherfucker. <laughs> nah, you don't see too many patriotic black people, man. It is for the benefits. Okay. Well, Donnell, thank you so much for coming back in, man. It's been thank too long. You. Everyone check out A New Day. It's a new it's day. out right now. It's out right now. I'm out right now. I'm excited about it. I'm excited about it. Somebody said, what makes this special? I think after a career of 31 years, right? I think that it's people that are rooting for me to have this. It's people that are, um, there are people out there that are excited about it. There are people out there that think it's long overdue. Mm -hmm. And I'm excited about it. And like, um, how funny something is, it's subjective to the style of comedy you like, yeah. but I will say the thing that I think that resonates through this special that it feels good and it feels like it's a new day. Well, yeah, and I think like after watching everyone's stand up right now, well, except for, uh, for, for Tony Woods. Yeah. I haven't watched his yet, Okay, but I watched everyone else's. I feel like the executive producers really made it a little bit shorter to get all the heat. Right. You know what I'm saying? Like, None of these, uh, you, Lunell, Earthquake, it never drags at any point. But it's here's all the thing, like... the, this series was only supposed to be 30 minutes. Aha, that's why. Every one of them was supposed to be 30 minutes. They're all like 35 minutes or so. 35 or 40. Yeah. Yeah, I, my, my intended to total is like, like 42. Okay. You know what I'm saying? But I will say this, when I talked about this with Dave, we talked about, he did Lunell's, he did Earthquakes, he did Tony, and he was really, 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 really adamant about he got all of them right. Uh -huh. He said, Daniel, your special in particular, he said, because of your uh, attachment to this brand of the Chappelle show and everything, he said, uh -huh. my, he said, yours is the most anticipated because True. of that. Yeah. And he said, if we do it, we got to do it right. And this was like, I think we did it right. I agree, man. I just watched it this morning and uh, I think you have a really, really dope stand up and everyone should go watch it. Thank you. I appreciate it. That's what it is. Until next time. Yes, sir. Peace.